Okay, so for today's lecture, we're going to talk about two topics. The conversion of alcohols into good leaving groups and the anti marcognacoff addition of HBr2 alkenes. So let's first start about the conversion of alcohols into good leaving groups. We have already have reactions that can do that, such as if we have a primary alcohol, get HBr, like so. Or if we have a tertiary alcohol, at HBr. In the first case, doing an SN2 reaction. The second case, we're doing an SN1 reaction. Now the problem with these reactions, it's fine for this examples, but HBr is not that selective. So if you have, say, a molecule like this, and add HBr to it, there's a good chance that you're going to get a mess, where you can do the SN2 reaction on the alcohol, but keep in mind HBr can also react with the alkene. Or you can get reactions with both. So it's a mess. So therefore, we're going to talk about ways of converting alcohols into good leaving groups that are very selective and react just with alcohols. So the first one. is PBr3. What PBr3 does is it converts alcohols into bromides, and it does so by an SN2 reaction only. It doesn't react by SN1. So what that means is it will react with the alcohol, and not with the alkene. It's not strongly acidic. And the mechanism is something like this, where the oxygen attacks the phosphorus and kicks off a bromine. Now, we haven't really talked at all about phosphorus chemistry. But a rule of thumb when it comes to phosphorus chemistry, if you don't start off with um, a bond to an oxygen to a phosphorus at the beginning of a reaction, you will have one at the end of the reaction, just because the oxygen-phosphorus bond is really quite strong. And this is a good leaving group. Bromide comes and does the SN2. and get your product. If you try to do this on a tertiary alcohol, you'll get no reaction. Okay. If you try to do this if you wanted to convert this OH into a good leaving group, well, you still could use HBr, but you end up with the same situation.
getting a mess. So there are other ways of converting. We need additional ways of converting OHs into good leading groups. Hence, second one. called tosyl chloride, and typically this is done with a base like triethylamine. And it converts OHs into OTS groups, tosylate groups. Tosylate groups are good leaving groups. Also, if we look, this doesn't have an O on it, but the product does. This oxygen right here is this oxygen right here. So the mechanism of this reaction is an acid-base reaction followed by an SN2-like reaction. Now, what tosyl chloride looks like looks like this. And what's happening in the reaction is you're doing an SN2 reaction, except you're reacting it on the sulfur and kicking the chloride off. And these are equivalent. Okay. So this is two ways of changing OH into a good leaving group. And if you ever have to change OH and alcohol into a good leaving group, use one of these two ways. Moreover, these ways are not identical to each other. In fact, they are complementary to each other. So let's say you have an optically active alcohol. And you want to change that into a leaving group. Well, the neat part about this is you have control over the stereochemistry of where that leaving group ends up being, where you can have it inverted. Or we can have the stereochemistry retained. And has to do with the two reaction conditions. PBR3 works by an SN2 reaction. And an SN2 reaction inverts the alpha carbon. Tosyl chloride doesn't change the stereochemistry about the alcohol at all. 
about the oxygen. So as a result, you can get this, and you can retain the stereochemistry. And you'll find that this can be quite useful in synthesis reactions and other reactions, especially when we're dealing with SN2 and E2 reaction. SN2, because of the inversion of the alpha carbon, and E2 because of the anticoplanar rule. So, example of this. So you have this molecule. And you want to make this. So go ahead and pause the video and work out what goes in that box. I'll wait. Okay. So, the thioether is made by an SN2 reaction. Key is to work backwards. Don't start here. Start at the back. We have negative sulfur adding to a molecule, or you could have the lithium salt of that sulfur, that kind of thing, either of those. And keep in mind that we want to, it's an SN2 reaction, so that's going to invert the alpha carbon. So we want the leaving group like this. Now, if we look by inspection, or we can also use RNS, assuming that leaving group has the highest priority, one, two, three, that's S, one, two, three, it's also S, so to go from here to here, we have to retain the stereochemistry, that's chosyl chloride and triethylamine. So going forward would be tosyl chloride, triethylamine, followed by your SN2 nucleophile. If you did the other way around, product would have been the wrong diastereomer. So this is an example of SN2. You can also think about it in terms of E2 reactions.
Now you want this molecule. Again, go ahead and pause it and try to work this problem out. Okay. Now, actually, it doesn't matter if the starting material is optically active or racemic. I'll just say it's racemic because it really doesn't matter in this case or in most elimination reactions because we are going, becoming a chiral. So, first thing to do is figure out what type of stereochemistry we need. We have to figure out which one is going to be our alpha carbon and which one's going to be our beta carbon. So if this is our alpha carbon, that means our leaving group goes on this carbon. If this is our alpha carbon, our leaving group goes on this carbon. Okay, that's the two possibilities. Now to figure out which of these two you need, you have to invoke the anti-coplanar rule. Because if you don't use the anti-coplanar rule, you'll end up with a mixture of both diastereomers. In this case, this is the correct one because both the alpha carbon and beta carbon you're using are both chiral centers. Down below, the red one does not work because neither one of those are chiral centers. And so if you do try to do an elimination reaction, you'll end up with both diastereomers instead of just one of them. Now, we need to figure out the proper stereochemistry. We've got the proper regiochemistry. which is this. Now we need to figure out the proper stereochemistry. Well, we already know what the stereochemistry on the beta carbon has to be. We don't have any control over that. We only have control over the stereochemistry of the alpha carbon. So the beta carbon, the methyl group is a wedge like that. Okay. So if the methyl group is a wedge, that means the hydrogen off of this carbon is a dash. Now by the anti-coplanar rule, if the hydrogen's a dash, your leaving group has to be a wedge. So this is what's necessary to react with a small base to give us this product. For those that would prefer, you can always draw, redraw this molecule like this. You do so. I want to double check the work. End up with this. Wedges end up cis to each other. Dashes end up cis to each other. Now, let's go through, figure out if to go from here to here, if we're going to use tosyl chloride or PBr3. Again, we can assign R and S. That is an S chiral center. Assume the leaving group has the highest priority. That's an R chiral center. So we, we, we inverted going from S to R. When you invert, that means you have to use PBr3. So what would go in the box would be PBr3 followed by sodium methoxide. And that gives the eliminated product.
So these two methods, PBR3 and tosylcloyth, complement each other quite well and are very useful in converting alcohols into leaving groups and then using it for other subsequent reactions. And this is especially true now because if we have an alkene, putting this into context, we have three reactions that can transform an alkene into an alcohol. If we use simply acid and water, we can react an alkene to form an alcohol, and we end up with rearranged products. If we want to avoid rearranged products and just have a Markovnikov addition, we can use oxymercuration, followed by demercuration. Or if we want the OH to be on the end, we can use hydroboration. All of these can convert alcohols into alkenes. Uh, sorry, all of these can convert alkenes into different alcohols. And now, with our added reactions of tosyl chloride and PBr3. We can convert these alcohols into good leaving groups to do subsequent reactions such as substitutions or eliminations. So that all sort of just ties together. Now, this reaction here is of particular importance because it's an anti-Markovnikov addition. We will have in this class only two anti-Markovnikov additions. This is one of them. Now it's time for a second anti-Markovnikov addition. And that's to do with HBr. HBr actually used to be very, very frustrating with chemists. Because when they treated an alkene with HBr, sometimes you end up with a Markovnikov addition, and sometimes you ended up with anti Markovnikov. And this was quite frustrating to chemists until they figured out why. They tracked it down to the bottles of HBr. Turns out new bottles of HBr gave Markovnikov, while old bottles gave anti-Markovnikov predominantly. And had to do with the fact that old bottles contained an impurity called a peroxide. And a peroxide kind of looks like this. Carbon attached to an oxygen attached to an oxygen attached to a carbon. If you use hydrogen peroxide, that's fine. Not a mess. But it only takes just the slightest amount to change the mechanism to give you an anti-Markovnikov. So, the mechanism. Well, first of all, for the purposes of this class, we'll assume that all the bottles of HBr that we're going to be using are either new or they have some sort of stabilizer that gets rid of the peroxides. 
So assume that regular bottles of HBr give Markovnikov additions. If you want, you can use HBr to give you anti-Markovnikov. You just have to add in a little bit of peroxide. And you really don't need much. It can be catalytic or not. You just need the slightest amount. And this mechanism right here it's a mechanism that's going to use a new type of intermediate called a radical intermediate. A radical intermediate involves a molecule with an unpaired electron. So, the mechanism of this reaction. The mechanism we're going to call is actually called a radical chain reaction. And radical chain reactions consist of ma some major steps. They consist of initiation. which doesn't happen very often. It needs to happen at least once, but after it happens, it doesn't need to happen again. And that's where we form the radicals. Propagation is quite common. This is where product is formed. The propagation is where you take one radical and make a new one. The last step in a radical chain reaction is what's called termination. Termination is very rare. In fact, you don't even need to show termination steps in these free radical reactions. What they are are two radicals coming together. So, the radical reaction an alkene plus HBr in the presence of peroxide. So, oh, before I get into that, I better talk about what radicals do. They have a tendency to do just a couple things. One is they take off hydrogens or halogens. Two, they add to pi bonds. And three, they combine with other radicals. These are the three main things that they do, though the last one's quite rare. And I suppose I had to say one more thing about radicals.
that radical stability mirrors that of carbocations. So the more stable a carbocation would be, the more stable radicals would be. So a tertiary radical, and we say radicals, typically by dot, are better than secondaries, much better than primaries, much, 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 much better than methyl radicals. Don't form methyl radicals. In fact, don't form primary radicals either. If you can, help it. Go for tertiary secondaries only. So, with that said, mechanism time. First step involves the peroxide. That OO bond is highly energetic. It's pretty weak bond. It just takes a little bit of heat and it has a tendency to break apart. And when it breaks apart, instead of the, both electrons going with each other, that bond is symmetrical. It breaks apart, so one electron goes onto one side of it. The other electron goes to the other oxygen. What we're using are single-headed arrows, fishhook arrows. And we use those to depict movement of a single electron. What we end up getting are two radicals. Now what these radicals do, this first step is the initiation step. Second step is this radical does what radicals like to do. It pulls off a hydrogen. And so this radical forms a bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen. One of the electrons from the hydrogen bromine bond meets it. And that creates the new bond between the O and the H. The remaining electron from the hydrogen bromine bond goes on to the bromine. As a result, what we've done is we've taken one radical and made a new radical. This is propagation. This bromine radical then does what radicals like to do. We've already seen a radical take off a hydrogen. Radicals can also add to pi bonds. This is where the radical stability comes in. If it adds to the pi bond on this side, that creates the carbon bromine bond here, puts the radical there. Or it can add to the other side. primary radical versus secondary radical. This is preferred. And this is also a propagation step. We've taken a bromine radical and made a carbon radical. This new carbon radical 
then finds another molecule of HBr and it pulls the hydrogen off. Same manner. Now it looks like this radical is just disappearing, but keep in mind there was one hydrogen on this carbon. Now there's two. And we generate, we go from one radical to a new radical. This is also propagation, which generates our product and generates another bromine radical. That another bromine radical finds another alkene and the process repeats itself. And keeps on repeating, repeating itself until some sort of rare event comes on, which is called termination. And termination events is where you take any two radicals out there and combine them together. That's a termination. This is very rare, mainly because radicals are very high energy species. That means they're very unstable, very short lifetimes. Chances of two unstable species actually finding each other and reacting together is actually very rare and doesn't happen very often. And so you don't have to worry about termination steps in a majority of reactions. So, let me go through that mechanism one more time. We're not going to worry about the reversibility of arrows because Technically, these are all probably reversible reaction steps. Form a radical. The radical reacts with HBr. Form an alcohol and a bromine radical. A bromine radical reacts with the alkene. Form a carbon radical. A carbon radical then combines, pulls off a hydrogen from HBr. And we get this. Okay. And that's the mechanism. Now, what I do want to specify is this reaction is unique to HBr. It does not work with HF. HCl or HI. And that has to do with the stability of radicals. You can think of it as the fluorine and chlorine radical. too high in energy form this way. In the iodine radical, it's too stable to react. With the alkene. That puts bromide, the bromine radical, in sort of a sweet spot where it's low enough energy to be able to be formed, 
but also reactive enough to do something. Okay, and that's it. Please um, place your questions on, on Piazza and I'll follow this up with a follow-up. So, okay.